Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to this week's episode of Back Garden Biology. We're down the far end of the garden today, starting anyway, and in the patch of cowslips that I showed you in the very first episode. But we're not looking at the plants themselves this time, we're looking at something that's been going on in the lawn. Frankly, there's been some funny events going on in this lawn, and I've been trying to unravel what's been happening. I have to dig my garden, as most gardeners do. I try to dig my garden as little as possible because I have heavy clay soil, which in the winter is impossible to dig because it's completely waterlogged. It's like digging into a big ball of solid clay, which you just can't do. And then as soon as it starts to get hot and dry, it turns into concrete. So digging is extremely hard work. So I'm always admiring of any animals that can dig with ease in this soil. And that's what I've found out here. So these cowslips were grown by my mother. She sowed some seeds last autumn and then she gave me this tray of young plants and I created some spaces for them, pushed aside the grass and plop, popped in these little plugs of soil. Little realising that that was making it a little bit easier for some animals that like to dig to find their way in. And I want to show you what one of them has been doing. I'm just going to lift aside this cowslip leaf. My cameraman is going to come in and show you this little hole and you can see there's the soil mounded around the side and a sizeable hole in the middle there. Now there's a few of those around this lawn that have been appearing over the last couple of weeks. I can find at least five or six of them perhaps and you may have even more in your lawn if you look carefully. So and I just saw its inhabitant leave as we literally spoke then. <laughs> But I've been setting out, staking out these holes, trying to find out who's in there. And that's what we're going to be talking about this week. Every good stake out starts with a location. And this is ours, a little hole in the lawn. You can see the pile of soil around it. But who exactly has made it? Well, our first guess was this little bee. It was sunning itself on a leaf at the back of the garden. And thanks to my colleagues, Tonya Lander and Liam Crowley, we think that this is a hawthorn mining bee. And you see on the back of her legs there, that's all those hairs that are to collect pollen to provision her young. So we staked out the lawn to see if we could see her in action. And sure enough, coming out of the lawn there does appear to be a hawthorn mining bee, but we can't really be confident about that because this isn't a terribly good shot. And so she flies away, leaving us a little bit none the wiser. A few minutes later, this appeared. Now this looks like a wasp. Uh, she then landed and we were able to get better shot of her right by the hole under the cowslips. And she is not a wasp. She is actually a type of bee. And she is called a nomad bee. And we think that this particular species is Gooden's nomad bee. She's mimicking a wasp for her own protection. And what she's going to do is go into the hole made by the mining bee and she's going to lay her eggs in there. And when her larvae emerge, they're going to eat the food supply and indeed the larvae of the mining bee. So these things generally are sometimes called brood parasites or cuckoo bees. This is the unfortunate victim. So this is the grey patched mining bee, Andrina nitida. And we have a really nice clear shot of her here. You can see the little grey patches. So we're quite confident about the species here. And we know that Gooden's nomad bee does indeed parasitise Andrina nitida. So we're quite confident about both of those IDs. And as if she didn't have enough to worry about, here are the bee flies again. This is a mating pair, which I managed to catch on film. The female bee fly also patrols the lawn over the mining bee nest and she flicks her eggs into the mines and her larvae will also emerge and eat the food and the larvae of the bees. So it really is a bee, bee world out there. 
So we had a lot of fun staking out the bees that were making those holes in the lawn, finding out who was who, who the original occupant was, and then learning that that second wasp bee uh, was actually a parasite taking advantage of the original occupant. If you want to try to identify insects, it is daunting because they're such a big, diverse group, but I really recommend this book. It's called A Comprehensive Guide to Insects of Britain and Ireland. It's by a guy called Paul D. Brock. No, I don't know him. I don't think he's anything to do with Oxford. It's not an Oxford University Press book, but it is a brilliant book and it has revolutionised my ability to identify insects. I was never very good at it, but with this book, I just feel a lot more confident. If we just open it up in a random place, you'll see every page is covered with these fantastic full colour pictures. He must have taken years to getting all these pictures together. There's a bit of a description of the species and a little map showing you where it occurs in Britain. And that's really important if you're convinced you've seen something, but you live in Oxfordshire and that insect only occurs in the far north of Scotland, then it's probably not what you've seen. There's also lots of good stuff online, of course, but this is a really great start. Okay, so we had a look at mining bees earlier. They are solitary bees, generally speaking, solitary anyway, that make those holes in the lawn, dig out these brood chambers. But there are other solitary bees that make their nests in other places. And you might be even more familiar with those because perhaps in your garden, you've got one of these. And this is a bee hotel. You can make them yourself or you can buy them. Or in this case, I was actually given this bee hotel. And you can see there are pipes, bits of bamboo with hollow centers. And those are to attract a different type of solitary bee, generally called mason bees. So mason bees make their, make their nests in soft mortar. So if you have an old wall, you might see them nesting in there. We certainly have them in the college. Um, you can also get leaf cutter bees using those homes. Those are bees that cut uh, little semicircles out of the edges of leaves. Roses are one of their favourites, or at least one of the common species likes to do that. Uh, so don't be alarmed if you see that happening, they're not going to really damage your plant. Um, and they plug, they use those leaves to plug the entrance, to make the individual brood cells and to seal off the chamber at the very end to stop other bees from entering because we see how they do get parasitised. Others, the mason bees, tend to use mud to block the chamber and that's one way that you can help to identify what you've got, what materials are they using to plug up the holes. Too early for that in my bee hotel, although someone's visiting and showing an interest, but take a look at my mum and dad's bee hotel. This is attached to their back wall where they've always had mason bees and you can see that it is an all out frenzy there with bees battling to get into the tubes and indeed my dad said they barely seem to do anything other than fight one another. So I'm not sure what species that is but I don't think I've ever seen a bee hotel with quite so many bees so pretty impressive dad I have to say. So we'll end where we began, back in this patch where I know the mining bees are busy and uh, it's amazing to think that there are hundreds of bee species in Britain, around 250 different bee species in Britain. The vast majority of those, most of us probably never realise we're ever seeing. They're small, much smaller than, than honeybees or bumblebees, so they kind of go under the radar. But they're actually really important pollinators. So, for example, at this time of year where, as we've seen, the bumblebees are not very active yet, it's only the queens out and about, a lot of the pollination that's going on now is being carried out by those solitary bees. They go on all through the year. There are species that come out early, species that come out later, and they are important. And if you can grow flowers that attract those kinds of bees and put up a bee hotel and just leave them alone in your lawn. When I was looking up some of the stuff online, I could see there were also, you know, people googling, how do I get rid of the mining bees in my lawn? Well, can I suggest you don't need to get rid of them. It's true that those solitary bees can sting, but very, very rarely. And if you were unlucky enough to be stung by one, it's nothing like as painful as a, a honeybee sting or a wasp sting. So it's a very, very mild sting. Obviously, if you're allergic to bee stings, then you have to be more careful but for most of us if you're not then really these things don't pose any threat to you at all so I hope you can have a wander around your garden and find some bees making homes in unexpected places <laughs>